Is that better? Okay, good. Several mistakes. Sorry about that. Okay, so what I want to say prospectively, so historically or retrospectively, that's the case, but I would like to encourage the logical side of the field, uh, more or less us, people who are here at Popple, not exclusively, but more or less, should pay more attention to efficiency, and I really wish the combinatorial side would pay more attention to structure, although I believe that I can reach you. I'm not so sure that I have any means of reaching them, so, but, uh, but we can try to do a better way. And for me, what I want to say partly in this talk is that the way to achieve this is the lambda calculus, okay? And that will come as no surprise to any of you here. But, you know, as soon as you say lambda calculus in front of an algorithms person, they go to sleep. It's like uh, they, don't, they don't want to hear it, right? That's just not the way it is done. So another way to explain this is to, is to borrow a phrase from Dijkstra uh, called on the Atlantic, uh, he wrote an essay called On the Fact that the Atlantic Ocean Has Two Sides. And I thought I would throw into the discussion here, my, I wish to make the following claim. Dijkstra was the very, most of you are too young to know, like to appreciate any of this. But let me just tell you, and I'll explain offline over dinner if you want or whatever. I think that Dijkstra was the first technical blogger. And he should be given credit for being the first blogger. Dijkstra did a lot of first things. I mean, it's amazing how much Dijkstra accomplished. It's astonishing, really. But one of the great things is he became a blogger before the notion of a blog. He started in the 1970s, early 1970s. So if you don't understand that, that's fine, OK? Uh, but uh, let's talk about that later. I, I wish we could get Dijkstra credit somehow for that. OK, anyway, uh, so on the fact the Atlantic Ocean is two sides, the two sides in question are the uh, North America and uh, Europe, let's say, uh, briefly. And the emphasis, as you probably know, in the US, uh, theory means combinatorial theory. And in fact, if I were to ever dare to say that I'm a theorist, it's just like, you know, like, forget it, right? It's basically some kind of presumption that is completely unwarranted because I'm not a theorist uh, from the point of view of an American, typical American computer science department. On the other hand, Euro theory, as it's sometimes called, I, I believe Mark Jerram coined that phrase, uh, but I can't prove that, uh, is, uh, is emphasizing semantics and logic. And uh, so that's been a tradition. I mean, there's been this. And it sort of correlates that what happens is, uh, is, is there's this kind of two-sided uh, two, two worldview, which I kind of want to join together. So both of these uh, approaches to theory have had, you know, extremely big influence on practice. So it's not possible to say, oh, one side of this is somehow better than the other. Now, of course, privately, we, we sometimes say that. And <laughs> I'm quite sure that some of my colleagues say the same thing behind my back. But, the, uh, but really, you know, efficient algorithms are obviously extremely important for you know, solving real problems. But so is language design and things like verification and looking at the human factors and building code. So uh, the fact is that these two theories, uh, so-called theory A and theory B sometimes say, you know, operate largely in isolation from one another, which I think is a shame. So now if you look, uh, and it goes back to the remark I made earlier, I want to say something about American theory. So American theory, if you ask, if you pick, you know, a random uh, person from the algorithms world, you know, they'll say, look, uh, the thing they're focused on is machine models. If you really push them into a corner, then they'll say, well, the, you know, the basic thing is the Turing machine or the RAM maybe, okay, which is a pretty awful situation. And it leads to a, a curious thing. But the idea is that it's low level, it doesn't offer any kind of abstraction or composition, and it's allegedly close to the hardware, but we know that's all BS. And I'll, and I'll, say, I'll say something about that a little later, but it's supposed to be close to reality. What's important about it, though, the reason, the, the technical reason it's chosen, is it gives rise to natural complexity measures. You know, you can count the number of uh, tape squares that the program supposedly uses on the Turing machine, or the number of instruction steps that are, that are as a way of counting how many steps you're taking. And the asymptotics smooth over the differences. The whole point of doing asymptotics is to sort of say, you know, all of the, uh, you know, they mod out by polynomials quite liberally. So all the uh, so-called all of the models of computation, except the one that matters, are polynomially equivalent. That's the idea. Okay. So that's the. So we don't care what it is. Now that leads to a very uh, a very curious state of affairs. One of which is a uh, very artificial, and I I think wholly uh, uh, non-existent distinction between an algorithm, which lives in the clouds, and a program. 
okay? They don't want to insist that, they don't want to admit that an algorithm is a program. Why? Because programs and Turing machines are so awful, right? You want to distance yourself from that as quickly as possible. That's a very strange state of affairs because an algorithm is a program, okay? But it's interesting about that. Okay, and the weird thing is, so what they do is they write some C-like notation or something, and then you're, then it's like, you know, you know, it's compiled like this, okay? And they tell you how it's compiled. So in other words, you're supposed to reason about programs by imagining how they're compiled. But, you know, the reality is that, you know, these days, people less and less often write code in languages that can be easily mentally compiled, okay? Just think of automatic storage management, if nothing else, okay? How are you going to mentally compile this, okay? And anyway, what the hell is a runtime stack in terms of the code you actually wrote? Well, uh, it doesn't exist, okay? Well, I'll tell you all about that stuff. It's a terrible way of going. Okay, so using this higher level language is an improvement, but it's still very limited because it emphasizes mutation, ephemeral data structures. This is a terrible idea, having only ephemeral data structures, manual memory management so that you can reason through the compilation. Very poor, I would even say, non-existent compos composability and no idea of abstraction at all. In other words, anything we care about as people is like that's right out the window, okay, in service of the machine. On the other hand, to be critical of the other side of what I'll call Euro theory here, the one to which I have my primary allegiance, uh, the Euro theory is based on language models, okay? What does that mean? What it means is the lambda calculus, okay? That's what it comes down to. So the point is, is that there, composition is fundamental. You see, uh, the, uh, Turing based his model on a very compelling and interesting psychological analysis of what computation would be. That's unbeatable, okay? But what did, what did Church do? He, he borrowed on the, one of the greatest intellectual achievements of the human mind due to the ancient uh, Indian and, and Persian mathematicians, which is the concept of a variable, okay? Think about it, it's like we feel like it's the air we breathe that we don't even, couldn't imagine a world without variables. Well, there's a world without variables at some point, and they invented the notion of variables. That's an extraordinary thing. And what is it? It's about composition, plugging in, okay? LD is doing substitution. Okay, so, uh, so we have that idea. So it's an elegant theory of composition. On the other hand, I mean, they get really good things going, like, for example, persistent data structures, automatic memory. You don't even think about memory management. You just work with structures as such. And uh, you get very strong composability, a theory of abstract types, all good things that everyone here loves, I would say. But, 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 to be fair, uh, there's been relatively little emphasis on efficiency. And I would say this is particularly true in the European world, which favors a particular point of view about this kind of programming that makes reasoning about efficiency almost impossible. Okay, and I think that that's a, that's a serious problem. So one thing is with the lambda calculus, uh, Mr. John Hughes here is uh, smiling at me. Uh, I, I wonder why. Okay, here's a curious fact. John Hughes and I were born on the exact same day in the exact same year. If you uh, believe in the zodiac, <laughs> there's something weird happened there, okay? I don't know how this happened, okay? Okay, uh, but there are very few uh, analytic results about efficiency, but Chris Ogasaki was a pioneer in this, and everyone knows and admires his work, and I want to sort of flag that as being a significant thing. So I want to argue then, my thesis here for this little talk is to say, traditional imperative methods of programming are obsolete. I mean, it's just a nightmare. And one of the things that's problematic is notions of parallelism. I don't have time to go into a lot of details. I'll give you some flavor. And I claim that functional methods are destined to dominate. I mean, there, there's no, I, to me, this is not even a comp uh, competition, okay? And so, uh, so what I want to do is that the way forward, I claim now, is to synthesize European and American theory. So one ingredient of this, there are many aspects to achieving this program. In fact, the reason I present it to you here at PLMW is I hope to inspire young people to think, God damn, you know, that's a really good idea. Why don't we figure out how to do this? There are people doing it. I don't want to present this as an ab initio thing, but I want to encourage, okay, that, uh, that, that people think about these ideas. So one idea that a Guy and I have been pursuing together off and on for decades is this idea of cost semantics. And the, uh, I will talk about two notions of cost because I want to refute 
Uh, I want to refute something that will come up a little bit later. Okay, so the idea about cost semantics is to assigning some kind of a measure to, 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 uh, to the cost of executing a program. Let's say that's the simplest idea. Where you assign this measure in a pretty much arbitrary way in the sense that you're working with an abstract programming language. You're not forced to think only about you know, instruction steps or tape squares. You can make up whatever you want, any abstract resource whatsoever, and you can count like how much of that resource is required. It's a beautiful thing. So what I want to talk about that, and then say assigning a measure to each execution, and then analyze its complexity of a program in terms of that structure. Now, if you're making up costs, which is what I'm going to show you how this is done, but if you're making it up, you're going to say to yourself, well, what's to stop you from making it up like and say, oh, everything costs zero, okay? Uh, well, that's a good question. Well, the point is that there has to be some accounting for reality. And this is where the meetup with uh, the traditional approaches of algorithm analysis come in, is we have to do what, uh, what is pr do what it, build what is called a bounded implementation. And it's a beautiful example of constructive proof. You prove there exists an implementation that meets certain bounds as a function of certain platform characteristics like memory size, interconnect properties, and so on, and I'll show you. And the existence proof is constructive. It's a compiler. Okay, so that's what you do, and a scheduler in the case of a parallel program. So I'll show you how this is done. So that's how you keep on us, but it's also just like a beautiful sort of story about how this works. So end to end, you get a clear separation of concerns, and you get uh, the kinds of results that you really want in the end. Okay, so that's uh, what I've said here, so I want to move along quickly. And in fact, yes, the whole story is so simple that at Carnegie Mellon, we've revamped our whole introductory curriculum, and we teach this stuff to freshmen. Okay, so everything I'm doing here, we teach the freshmen. Now the key is, is something that I, I find, I still feel that I'm uh, leading a lonely life about, which is the importance of having formal definitions for programming languages. Name one, okay, you can name one that has that. Can you name two? Okay, you can't, okay? And there are reasons for this, okay? Uh, what? Scheme. Scheme, okay, two. <laughs> Actually, I would dispute that, but never mind. Okay, okay. so here's an example of what we're doing. We give a formal definition. Uh, you're, I'm trying not to commit John Hughes's, uh, 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 cr the crime that John Hughes mentioned. There's only one rule, and I'm gonna fill it in. So this is the evaluation rule for application. I hope that many of you have seen it. The idea is I annotate these things with a graph structure, which is written like this, and there's a little algebra of graphs. Let's not worry, because I'm gonna go with pictures, okay, which tell you what these are. I'm gonna skip over exactly in detail what the algebra of graphs are and show you what the idea is. So the idea is you get a picture like that. So if you look at an algorithm, you get a picture like that, and they represent the dependencies amongst the subcomputations in a large computation. And the idea is that the dependencies just say something depends on something if it can't be executed until it knows what the previous result is. If there is no such dependency, then they're side by side. So that leads to cost measure, which we call the work and the span. And what are the work and the span? The number of nodes and the diameter of that graph. Okay, that's the idea. So that gives you right away a notion of sequential cost, how much work do you need to do altogether, and a notion of its parallel cost, irrespective of any platform characteristics. You can't run faster than the span. If you have sequential dependencies, well, you can't use parallelism. If it's really kind of fat and bushy, then you can use parallelism. So that's the, the rough idea. So if you look at something like merge sort, which, I'll quick, uh, which I will uh, skip over the code of, uh, the work can be done, you know, uh, in, in the code I gave, it can be done in order n log n time, and you can then analyze what its span is, which I don't have time to explain here, is very sensitive to choice of data structure. If you insist on doing something on lists, which lots of languages like the aforementioned one emphasize, that's a really, that's a really bad idea, but if you have a richer uh, abstract type mechanism, including types at all, then you can, uh, then you can uh, do much better. Okay, so that's the idea. So you get a bound, depending on which form is, you get a bound like, for example, uh, log cubed n on a tree when you're doing on the tree. Let's not worry about how that's done. It's a clever uh, algorithm for doing this. And, you, uh, and, you have, and so what you have is a situation where the correctness of the algorithm is never in question, and you get a bounds that you want. And then we do use something called the Brent type theorem, which is Brent's principle, which is this thing I told you about before, bounded implementation. So I can say that the general theorem here is if you have work W and span D, you can implement it on a PRAM with uh, the time that is stated there. And the idea is you can't run 
any faster than the span, and you can run in chunks of p insofar as that's possible. So that's the idea. Okay. So I don't have time to explain it, although I thought I might. So what I wanted to explain is that gives you a flavor for, for just like sequential and parallel execution time. So recently, you know, you often get accused, they say, oh, yeah, 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 all that stuff is really good. But you know, real programmers have to deal with things like, for example, memory hierarchies and what is called the I.O. complexity. And you can't do that in your programming. You have to do memory allocation. You've got to take care of it. That is not true. So this past summer, Guy Blalock and I had a paper in CACM Research Highlight, which is about I.O. efficiency. And the main idea here is, I'm going to have to skip over it, but the main idea here is you can devise a cost semantics where you can talk about the figure of merit is merely the traffic between primary and secondary memory. All instructions are free. Everything costs zero. The only thing that costs anything is the movement between primary and secondary memory. So how do you express that? Well, you give a cost semantics that I'm not going to be able to go into in a great, uh, in a great uh, amount of detail, but you keep track of how things are allocated while you're executing, and you keep track of the distinction between primary and secondary memory so that you can give a figure of merit which tells you the traffic. What is the traffic as on the bottom line here between the primary and the secondary memory? And so I won't go through how we do that, but it looks a lot like what I did a moment ago. And then there's a Brent-type theorem which tells you how to take that abstract notion of cost, this I.O. cost, and map it as a function of platform parameters. So if a machine that has a certain cache size uh, and, uh, and so on, then you can explain exactly how to implement it. And we've done that, and the, the paper sketches the compiler and runtime system for how you achieve that. So uh, let's not worry about the, we, we use several ideas, one of which is Andrew Appel's, who may be in the audience, uh, and Danny Slater's, and some idea that Guy and I cooked up in order to achieve that bound. So it has that flavor of, you have an abstract analysis, and then you map it onto a concrete platform as a separate thing. So here is the code, and let's not worry, I don't have time to go into that. So what I want to say is here then in closing is that the cost semantics idea supports analysis of complexity of the code you actually write and the code you actually run. There's no need for pseudocode. You don't have to reason through the image of a compiler about how it's supposedly compiled, which is never true in any case. Okay? You can choose the costs in various ways that you want. So for example, uh, sequential and parallel time, space users of scheduling, like uh, our student uh, Dan Spoonhauer and our collaborator uh, Phil Gibbons uh, worked on a few years ago, memory hierarchy effects, which, which is stuff that we uh, just talked about a moment ago, and other things. So, to finish, then, the lambda calculus gives you a logical, logical model of comp, comp, computation, which is inherently compositional and mathematically, I would say, sensible. And the cost semantics integrates the combinatorial aspect so that we can uh, enrich, enrich the tools available to algorithm designers and then extend complexity analysis to you know, mathematically elegant languages. So to finish, I would say, where, where from here? Well, there's lots and lots of stuff to do. Lots of people have been looking, uh, uh, Uma Dachar and Guy and uh, Stefan Muller have been looking at memory traffic in parallel processors, their communication complexity measures, and so on. The other thing I would mention is a growing number of people who are developing mechanical tools for doing analysis and verification of resource usage that are along the time, lines of the tools we've used for correctness properties until now. For example, type systems and their improving systems. And that include uh, Hoffman and Hoffman. There's, uh, I think, uh, Ogden Nash wrote uh, some little uh, poem about this, uh, about, the, about this name. Uh, uh, so there's a 1F Hoffman and a 2F Hoffman, and, and Zhang Xiao, who may also be here, who are involved in doing that. And uh, Andrew Appel is using general they're improving methods and looking at algorithm complexity. And I'm sure there's lots of other people I, I haven't mentioned, but those are some that come to mind. And the idea is that using these ideas, we can improve both the structure and the efficiency of programs and have beautiful code that is you know, self-evidently correct as functional programs are and, uh, and for which we can analyze the complexity of how much, how much time they take, John Hughes. Okay, so, uh, uh, so let me, let me, uh, let me uh, finish uh, with that. Thanks for your attention.
What was the question? The slides available online. I will make them online. Are you asking me? Yes. I, maybe the PLMW organizers are doing that. So, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. The social obstacles, you mean? Well, I also ask for technical, but maybe social. Oh, the technical obstacles are huge. I mean, achieving compositionality of analysis for algorithms is extremely difficult. In fact, it's not uh, like somehow, uh, you know, it's merely ignored. Uh, it's, it's the fact that it's extremely difficult to know what these are. So I think these are directions for work, is to try to do this and try to understand how we can, uh, how we can put these things together. I don't mean to trivialize the problems. I only mean to emphasize their importance. 